welcome to the official All Things Watch podcast, where we talk all things, movies, television, streaming, and everything in between, and I am super excited to be here with you awesome fine folks today, because the time has finally come for us to be able to openly talk about the brand new Deadpool and Wolverine film, which is pretty well sort of like a nod or a tip of the hat almost love letter type of film towards everything that Fox has built with the X-Men franchise and now that Disney has taken over the rights this is sort of like a a farewell sort of like the ending of one chapter but the beginning of another however I will say that I was very surprised with how little Deadpool really is in the MCU like with the way that this film was marketed I really thought that this this movie was going to be like you know legitimately like a hardcore mcu film but it's really not you know this film still takes place in the fox universe or what they designate as the one zero 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 five i think it was or nine universe uh so it's still technically not even in the 616 universe it's still in its own little universe and it is very much a small uh very small contained story and all that good stuff uh but still overall it was a lot of fun it was a great movie and in this podcast today we are going to literally do a scene by scene breakdown of the entire film i managed to get all of these uh photos online of course most of the movie is leaked online by now anyways uh the only thing is i just can't get high definition quality so you'll have to put up with the uh you know the resolution so i got the best quality that i could so with that being said folks once again this is your last warning this is a spoiler review and with that being said we're just going to go right ahead and jump in so the movie actually opens uh with pretty well uh, you know one of the scenes that we see in the trailer when this film opens deadpool is already sort of on the run from the TVA and he actually acknowledges Logan's story or the ending of Wolverine when Hugh Jackman retired back in I believe it was 2017 Hugh said he really loved how the character ended with Logan how he sacrificed himself to save X-23 well this movie literally opens with Deadpool acknowledging that sacrifice and acknowledging how cool of an ending it really was he literally opens the movie by saying now how can we you know start our movie without sort of you know uh you know doing dishonor to the logan franchise and then he literally says well we can't and so he's here to dig up logan's corpses and the reason why at this point in time we don't know why but once the movie continues we learn that this movie has introduced a new concept to the multiverse where each universe has its own anchor and in this situation in deadpool's situation logan or wolverine is actually his anchor so this is a really good way to keep everything that we've already seen from the fox franchise uh, a great way to keep it canon a great way to keep it still important a great way to keep logan untouched and unhinged but while also taking all of that history and taking all those movies including logan and then building off of that going now under the disney banner because they kept the ending of logan because here as you can see wolverine obviously is still dead he's a skeleton the only thing that's left is the animantium that was surrounding his bones the metal uh and so the reason why deadpool's universe is dying is because wolverine was his anchor and as you can see wolverine is dead this also verifies that Deadpool is a part of that same X-Men universe. He was a part of the Logan universe, uh, but they sort of just chalk it up in the sense that Logan still died in the future, but his death was so significant that it had ripples through time. And I just really, really liked that. And so as the scene continues, uh, one really cool shot that I really enjoyed right before the title came up for Deadpool and Wolverine, we actually see Deadpool uh, putting on the Wolverine claws. As you can see, he takes the animanium, which is what, which was would have been the small bones and maybe to some degree even a uh, little vein so to speak that went around uh, Wolverine's arms uh, and then he actually wears them which I thought was really cool and this is when the story really starts uh, you know because once we uh, once he we see this then he sort of goes back in time specifically back to March 14th 2018 and he basically starts to tell the story from here and we do get a six years later uh, after this sequence as well which tells us that Deadpool and Wolverine that movie actually takes place during 2024 if my math is correct I might be a little bit wrong but I, I do think that it takes place during 2024 
And so this is actually the same format that the original Deadpool movie uh, took. It took this same format where they sort of, you know, Deadpool sort of started off already in the middle of an action sequence, and then he went back to tell the story to catch you up as to how he got there and why he's here. So now we're back at March 14, 2018, but this time we are actually in... Uh, the universe 616 and as you can see Deadpool actually meets Happy Hogan and you can excuse me you can see that the you have the Iron Man ar uh, armor in the background in the suitcase from Iron Man 2 you can see Cap's shield in the background you also see that on Happy Hogan's desk he also has that little uh, souvenir that Pepper Potts gave Iron Man back in the very first Iron Man which said proof that Tony Stark has a heart that was there so something else that this tells us is that Cable's device was not only able to make him be able to travel through time which we've seen in Deadpool 2 uh, but it also allows him to actually travel through space as well so time and space now they don't ever really specify in the movie if Cable's uh, technology was able to do this on its own or if he had to actually modify it but I don't think that that part is really relevant I don't think it really matters as to how or why he was able to do it. It's just the fact that he was able to do it, and that's really the only thing that was relevant. And and so uh, then Deadpool ends up going back to his own universe, which I believe was designated as one zero 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 five or nine. I can't remember the last number, but it was it, you know it is one zero zero zero. I think it was five though. And so this is the Fox universe. This is the same universe that had all the X Men movies, including the Wolverine trilogy, which I think the Wolverine trilogy was really uh, the only was really what they mainly focused on. We did have characters from the X Men movies, but I think it was the Wolverine trilogy that mainly that they mainly focused on, which makes sense because this here is uh, the third movie of the Deadpool trilogy. So Deadpool gets back to his original uh, universe, the universe that he's actually from, and then we pretty well get the sequence that they show in the trailer, and honestly they show pretty pretty well i won't say every single part of this sequence but they do show probably like 90 percent of this whole sequence in the trailer uh you know he blows out the candle he has that funny scene with uh with, with the uh with al blind al where you know she's talking about doing cocaine and he's like hey you know cocaine is the one thing feige said was off limits and so we get that whole sequence like we see in the trailer and then of course as soon as he blows out the candle we get the knock on the door from the tva and of course they do look a little bit different but I do think that this um, that this movie did sort of uh, chalk up a few questions that we had because one question that we had was well for one why was Mr. Paradox working with the TVA uh, and, and whatnot because once they uh, kidnap Wade here they bring him to the TVA and of course the first person he meets is Mr. Paradox and so the question that we all sort of had was well where's the rest of the TVA the agents that we do uh, normally affiliate someone like Mobius and whatnot you know where's Loki in all this and another question that I always had was how does the multiverse work is it a multi is it is it an infinite amount of multiverse or is it just one multiverse but within that multiverse an infinite amount of of, of uh, you know variants and choices and decisions or so is it like one multiverse with infinite possibilities or is it multiple multiverses infinite multiverses if, if you get what I'm trying to say but I do think that this movie does sort of allude to the idea that there is only one single TVA and that one TVA sort of overlooks all of the multiverse so I think uh, what it really is. I don't think it's a multiverse of multiverses. I think it's one single multiverse with infinite amount of expansion. Now, I could be completely wrong. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about that, but that's how I took it because there is a character in this movie eventually who I believe was B-15 in the Loki series who's now in charge of the TVA and she does show up at the end of this, which makes me think that the TVA is sort of, there is only one type of TVA, one version of the TVA, but it's broken up into sectors and so the Fox universe or Deadpool's universe was under the supervision of Mr. Paradox and so right from this very get-go we learn that Mr. Paradox is actually the villain he literally says it right from the very get-go he is somebody who believes in the old way which was pruning but we know when uh, Loki took over he sort of got rid of that whole concept of pruning timelines and and whatnot because you know obviously you'd be killing you know a, a huge billions and billions of people so he took 
took that away, the whole idea of pruning, and he now allows the multiverse to flourish and have free will and freedom of choice where everybody can basically do uh, as they please. And so we actually learned that here with Mr. Paradox, and we learned that he believes in the old way. This is also when Mr. Paradox shows Wade the footage, literally using footage from the movie Logan, this is where he explains Anchor, uh, the Anchor concept where every universe has an anchor. I'm willing to bet, I don't know for sure, but I'm willing to bet that our main universe, 616, I'd be willing to bet that maybe Robert Downey Jr. was the anchor, uh, or his character, Tony Stark, or Iron Man. I'm thinking that maybe he was the anchor, or maybe even Kang himself, Kang the Conqueror, maybe he was the anchor, or something like that. So I'd be very curious to know who the anchor is in our main universe, but I'd be willing to bet that it's the either Iron Man or Kang the Conqueror because it's funny how the moment Kang the Conqueror uh, or uh, not Kang the Conqueror but the moment that uh, Iron Man died and sacrificed himself in in uh, Endgame that's when all the multiverse chaos started to happen you could make an argument and say well actually all that stuff happened when Kang was killed but I don't think that I would fully agree with that given the fact that the Scarlet Witch in WandaVision excuse me she was able to you know sort of travel the multiverse herself so I have a feeling that all this stuff uh, started to happen and the multiverse sort of started to unravel when uh, in Endgame right after Robert Downey Jr. Uh, snapped his fingers and sacrificed himself so here we learn that Logan is the anchor and then we get the big reveal here, of course, with Mr. Paradox. Mr. Paradox basically revealing that he really is the true villain, uh, more so because he just uh, wants to basically wipe out uh, Deadpool's universe. He tells Deadpool that his universe is going to die, but it's going to take a couple thousand years. Uh, so, and it seems to me like he just doesn't want to wait that long, and he does, and he doesn't want these people to suffer. So he's like, you know, he. We learn that he's building a machine, which uh, by the end of the movie will be taken over by Cassandra Nova, and basically this machine has the ability to to prune. Uh, Deadpool's timeline. So there were a little bit of, a little few inconsistencies with this. For one, you know, we already learned that the TVA is outside of time. Even though time still exists in the TVA, they are in sort of their own little pocket dimension. You know, we know this because Loki himself already went to the end of time before he took over the multiverse, before he, uh, you know, sort of become like God Loki or, or the God of Stories, even though he's not really the God of Stories, but he's, he's like a He's like a, a weak version of God of Stories, uh, but, you know, so that was a little bit inconsistent with me. I couldn't really figure out why Mr. Paradox wanted to just go ahead and destroy the universe because, you know, he's, you know, he, he's going to be at the TVA in 2,000 years' time anyway, so why did he really do this? And something else that I thought was really strange as well is that he did call Deadpool out of his universe, and he took him out because he said that he was ordered to from someone higher up, but then at the same time, he's going against orders by getting ready to prune this timeline, so to me, like, there was a little bit of consistency, consistencies there with that. I just couldn't really figure out, like, why would he even bring Deadpool in here to begin with if he only wanted to prune the timelines uh, because he does seem like he doesn't, you know, it seems like he's not too worried about killing billions of people. So why all of a sudden would he care about Deadpool, you know, and not only that, but if he was really here and, you know, if he was following orders and somebody told him to take Deadpool in, then how is it that he was able to build that machine without anybody noticing and all, and all these sorts of things. So there were a few little loopholes that I just didn't really understand. Like, I didn't really understand how, either A, Mr. Paradox got away with building the machine, and then also B, if he was going to build the machine, why save, uh, you know, why save Deadpool at all? And, and whatnot, you know, and for that matter, if, if, if Logan was the anchor, then why not just save Logan, you know what I mean, like, all this could be avoided if he just had went back and saved Logan, so there was a few little plot holes like that throughout the movie that I just didn't really understand, uh, but anyways, I just kind of looked past it, it's still a great movie, and I still really enjoyed it, and so then we get back to, um, and then we get back to the fight sequence then, of course, with, uh, Deadpool and, uh, in the, you know, with, with the fighting sequence that we've seen at the very opening of the movie, and now we are pretty well fully caught up, and now we understand why he was there, why he was digging up uh, the remains of Logan. It was because he's trying to replace his anchor with a new Wolverine. He's trying to replace the old Wolverine that died in Logan with a new Wolverine in hopes of trying to save his universe and this is when we sort of get our first set of cameos which were really really cool 
Deadpool goes through uh, the portal because once again, like I said, he's looking for a whole whack load of different Wolverines. And we actually do get a very quick sneak peek of Hulk and Wolverine. As you can see here, Hulk literally makes an appearance for like two seconds and then he disappears. But it was still really cool to see him. In fact, I really enjoyed this cameo so much that uh, because we're now in the multiverse, I actually, uh, you know, I have a multiverse list of how I watch the movies now. I watch the movies in a certain order, not necessarily how they came out in the MCU. To you my first movie no longer is necessarily Iron Man because we are in the multiverse now sort of everything is canon maybe I'll do a video or a podcast eventually uh, telling you guys how I like to uh, watch all the movie projects and how it makes sense to watch them in the order that I watch them in uh, but either way uh, as soon as I seen this cameo, I was like, okay, well, as soon as uh, I'm done watching Deadpool and Wolverine, the next uh, film that I want to watch, short animated film that I want to watch after this one now will be Hulk versus Wolverine, because I just think, think it's so fitting. And plus, Hulk versus Wolverine was a great anime, and also had Deadpool in it as well. So we got the Hulk. Then the next cameo we got to see was actually Patch. A lot of people thought maybe Daniel Radcliffe was going to be portraying this character online before the movie came out, or somebody else. But it turns out that it was just Hugh Jackman but it was still really cool to see Patch as you can see he actually puts uh, his claws through uh, Deadpool's you know head and whatnot so that was really cool uh, this here is a little bit of a surprise to me uh, I was surprised to see Henry Cavill actually portray uh, Wolverine and honestly he looked pretty good uh, you know he's a really big guy as well you know a lot like Hugh Jackman he's really tall he's really jacked uh, you know he's a lot bigger than uh, you know the comic book accurate Wolverine which is actually something that they actually showed uh, they actually had Wolverine be in this uh, film, uh, but at the appropriate height of, you know, how he will be in the comics, which I think is only like five foot or five foot one or something like he's really short in the comics. And so one of the one of the variations that uh, that Wade actually comes across is actually uh, Wolverine portrayed by Hugh Jackman, but he's really, really short and he's only like five foot. And it does look pretty silly once you see it in live action. So it kind of justifies why they would choose Hugh Jackman. And even though Hugh Jackman is like six foot tall, you know, it sort of justifies how, you know, it makes sense for Wolverine to be big in the MCU, maybe not so much in the comics or in the animated series, but in the real live adaptations, it probably makes more sense to have an actual big guy portray Wolverine. So that was really cool. And then the very last variation, oh, and also when Wolverine sees Henry Cavill, he actually calls him Calverine, which was really funny as well. He breaks the fourth wall. And then, of course, he ends up coming to the variant, once again, that we see in the trailer, which is Wolverine being in a bar uh, and, and whatnot. And we learn that Wolverine is actually wearing his yellow suit underneath his clothing, which was rumored online, which turned out to be true. And this is the uh, Wolverine that Deadpool ends up choosing uh, and brings, and he actually takes him and brings him back to the TVA and as you can see he ends up dragging him back to the TVA and he tells Mr. Paradox okay you know this should do it this should be uh, enough to fix uh, you know Deadpool's universe because he's trying to save everybody that he loves and so Mr. Uh, Paradox tells Deadpool that it's not that simple anchors cannot be replaced so you can't just uh, you know he can't just get a get a, a, a variant and then just throw him in uh, there's that simply is not going to work which is actually something else that I had sort of a little nitpick once um, by the time you get to the end of the film how the film concludes I was kind of like well that doesn't really make sense because he does you know technically because well we'll get to that when we get to the end of the movie but I there, that was another little hiccup in the plot I, I didn't really understand so because it just didn't make sense the way that they set it up but anyways he brings this version of Wolverine here in his yellow clothing and of course, Mr. Paradox ends up pruning uh, both Deadpool and Wolverine, which is how they end up getting into the Void. Now, this actually sort of really makes sense because, as we know, the Void is pretty well a no man's land, and I do believe that they are going to end up using the Void as sort of a uh, battle world when Secret Wars come. And so, as you can see, when they get to the Void, there's literally the 20th Century Fox logo buried in the ground sort of uh you know indicating that it's dead it's you know it failed it's dead you know disney brought the rights to the x-men and whatnot but uh but so i really thought that it was kind of clever for them to have a big portion of the movie here in the void because the void is like i said sort of neutral it's kind of like a no man's land and uh which is really how this most of this movie is it's not really in the mcu but it's also not really in the fox universe either because most of the movie takes place here in the void or at least a good chunk of it and so it is sort of you know in between worlds and like i said this is a great spot that 
that they could eventually turn into Battle World for Secret Wars. Not to mention, you know, from the Loki series, we already know that there were variants from Loki. And then, of course, in this movie, we have more cameos from different franchises as well. And one thing that they do clarify, and specifically uh, one of the first cameos we see uh, here in a few minutes, uh, they actually specify that if you're in the void, there's really only two possibilities. You either get eaten by a Lyoth, which you can remember back from Loki, uh, this is, uh, they sort of went against the Lyoth, and that was how they ended up reaching the end of time at the Citadel, where Kang the Conqueror was. Uh, uh, yeah, the Citadel, Kang the Conqueror Citadel at the end of time. Uh, or you would have to work for Cassandra Nova. So Cassandra Nova is basically ruling over the Void. Uh, but before we get to that point, we get a really cool battle sequence between uh, Wolverine and Deadpool. He... Uh, Wolverine's basically really upset because Deadpool, you know, pulled him out of his timeline and now he's stuck here in the Void and neither one of them really understand even what's going on. They don't even really understand what the Void is. Uh, all they know is that they are trapped. But, uh, so they have a really cool, very brutal fight. But Deadpool is able to actually convince Wolverine to help him be, by sort of manipulating him because he says, well, the TVA must have the ability to change his world because in this version of Wolverine he has apparently let down his entire world and he has failed uh, the X-Men and failed to save the X-Men and and over something uh, that happens over a certain set of events that happens and he feels the consequences of it he feels very guilty he basically takes on all the blame for himself which is why he wears the yellow suit because we learn in the movie that he says that it was you know Gene and Scott and Beast uh, and storm that always wanted him to wear the suit but he never ever did because he thought it was funny and he just didn't really want them to think that he was a part of the team uh, but then when he wasn't there and the events happened in which they all died uh, then he had such so much guilt that now he never takes the suit off and he sort of literally emotionally figuratively and also literally physically wears that pain on him uh, every time he goes around or goes anywhere but he ends up managing to uh, to convince him to help him because like I said he says the TVA if they have the power to you know be able to sort of be outside of time and to some degree even manipulate time a little bit then they should be able to uh, save Wolverine's world and this is really what convinces Logan to stop fighting Deadpool and actually help him and then we get uh, and then we get our first or next uh, first really first real big cameo which of course is uh, Chris Evans and he appears and I really love how they set up this whole cameo because if like it takes them probably like a full minute maybe even a minute and a half to actually reveal who it is I actually didn't even recognize his voice when he started to speak uh, and then so uh, at this point this is after Deadpool has already seen uh, all the screens at the TVA this is after he had already seen uh, the monitors and seen the Avengers and Captain America and all that stuff which by the way on those monitors Deadpool also, also seen a clip from the future which involved him being held by Thor so I do think that that's sort of a foreshadow for uh, Secret Wars now whether or not Deadpool will actually die I don't know about that he does have a regenerative uh, healing factor to him but you never know once we go into Secret Wars and we start to have people like Victor Von Doom or even Doctor Strange people that are very intelligent and very smart and even magical maybe the combination between magic and technology maybe they will eventually have the ability to actually uh, eliminate the x gene maybe actually make them human so maybe something will happen to deadpool in the future where he ends up losing his healing factor causing him to actually die in Thor's hands but who knows but either way this was a really cool cameo and of course Deadpool goes up to him and starts treating him as Captain America but what we learn is that this Chris Evans is actually not Captain America this is not Steve Rogers this is actually Johnny Storm and he rather than saying Avengers Assemble he actually says flame on and he ends up uh, you know catching himself on fire uh, and then he flies away which was so cool once again a great callback to the original Fantastic Four uh, you know, well, the original Fantastic Four, say in the MCU era, say since the 90s uh, and, and whatnot. So it was really great to see him back, uh, come back as Johnny Storm. And I really liked how uh, how they sort of played this fight out as well with him and Pyro because Pyro has the ability to control uh, fire and he actually sucks the fire out of uh, Johnny Storm completely. 
to the point where Johnny Storm actually falls. Now, technically speaking, Johnny uh, should have been killed from that, um, you know, from that fall, I would think. Uh, but given the fact that he is sort of like a mutant, I guess he did, he did have a uh, genetic, you know, something happened to him genetically, then I, I was able to look past it, then I could just say, well, maybe he can heal to some degree anyways. But I do think that that fall should have absolutely killed him and whatnot. And then we come to another, then the next cameo we get, of course, which is not so big, they did reveal this cameo in the trailer, which was, of course, Sabretooth. So Sabretooth and Wolverine ends up having their fight. The only thing that I didn't really like about that is that, you know, Deadpool does say that this is the fight of the century. People were waiting for over a century to see this fight. And I just felt like that was not true and quite underwhelming because of the fact that nobody really cares about that Sabretooth. And if anything, I would think that the Sabretooth that was in Wolverine Origins would have been a lot better than this one. So that would have been a really cool fight to see if we could have gotten that actor back. But so you know when Deadpool says you know people have waited for over a century to see that I don't I didn't think that that was really funny and I don't think that he was serious either I think he did say it in a joking manner but for me that joke just didn't really land because I just thought they could have done so much more with the movie I mean the fact that they had the Hulk make an appearance in the movie like why not just have Hulk here and they could have gave us like a four or five minute uh, fight of Wolverine versus Hulk but maybe who knows maybe for uh, maybe for certain movie rights or something or uh, they just didn't want to do it or maybe they're saving that for a future title maybe they'll save that for world war hulk that'd be pretty cool to see wolverine in that movie but i i don't know we might never see world war hulk and we might never ever see a real live adaptation of wolverine versus hulk but either way it was pretty cool to see uh the hulk but i don't think i don't agree that this is a fight that anybody really cared about but either way it happens and uh, so eventually uh logan and Wade and Johnny all ends up getting captured uh, and then they end up being uh, brought to the villain of the movie who is of course Cassandra Nova. Now Cassandra has the ability to go to and from uh, the void because we learn later on in the movie that she has what appears to be a sling ring and she does talk about a magician so whether or not it was actually Doctor Strange or a version of Doctor Strange or whether or not it was Wong or any of the uh, sorcerers really uh, we don't really know who it is. All she says is magician. Uh, so me, I was thinking probably strange. I think Deadpool even says it. He's like that, uh, he's like strange or something like that. I think he says. Uh, but her sling ring did appear to have two infinity stones on it. it. Looked like the reality stone and I think maybe time stone. I think it was a red and green. But they only show it for like a second. So Cassandra Nova does have the ability to go in and out of the void uh, but from what I can gather it seemed like she had some form of agreement with the TVA which is why she just sort of stayed there she didn't really come out of the void she liked being in the void she was basically the queen she ruled everything there and nobody could really overpower her and so you know it just seems to me like they had this agreement with the TVA and that's how she remained there and why she remained there uh, but she did have the ability to leave if she wanted because by the end of the movie she does leave <clears throat> excuse me and uh and, and, you know, she does end up coming into uh, Deadpool's world, which would be the world 10005, I believe it was, or 9. And so here she ends up confronting Johnny Storm, and uh, he, he, she actually kills Johnny Storm here, literally takes the flesh right off his body, and then he just falls because I guess he has no muscle or any skin to hold it all together, so everything just kind of falls everywhere and whatnot. And so it was actually a pretty gory, pretty bloody, pretty disturbing scene. So I didn't want to take the screenshot of that part of it. Uh, but I did want to just show, you know, two of them interacting. And also, how cool was it to see Chris Evans come back and play this uh, such a different character? Uh, but then we come back to Deadpool here. Uh, and once uh, Deadpool ends up confronting Cassandra Nova, we see her using her powers in a very disturbing, uh, almost horrific way. You know, her hand is actually going through his face. And I would assume that they can all still feel this. But she ends up doing this to Mr. Paradox by the end of the movie, too. And so I was a little bit confused about how he would be able to survive. I could see Logan and Wade surviving because they have that healing factor. Neither one of them can really truly die. Uh, you know, at least not to, with age. You know, Logan can die. Obviously, he died in, in the movie Logan. But that was, you know, after two, being alive for like two or three hundred years or however long he was alive. Uh, this Wolverine in this movie claims that he was alive for two hundred years. So, 
you know, he still has that healing factor. He's still strong and for the most part pretty healthy. And we know Wade can survive, but I wasn't really 100% sure how Mr. Paradox was able to survive unless Cassandra Nova actually has the ability to heal them or like maybe she can control whether or not they die or maybe she can control whether or not they feel it. But either way, when she goes into Deadpool's uh, head here, she ends up... We get a lot of really cool flashback scenes, which actually sort of fills in the gaps a little bit and sh sort of shows us what happened between her, him and Vanessa and how they sort of drifted apart. And it seems like uh, ever since, from what I can gather, it seems like ever since 2018, when he went to Earth 616 to join the Avengers, which we've seen at the beginning of the movie, and when he was rejected, he sort of never really recovered from that. He sort of went through like a midlife crisis because I think he felt like he wasn't a good enough suit superhero he wasn't a legitimate superhero because of the fact that he was rejected they wouldn't let him on the Avengers so he sort of you know got all depressed about that which end up drawing you know uh, putting a big division between him and Vanessa and she really just wanted him to be the best superhero that he could be or just be the best version of himself but he just couldn't do it I guess because he was too depressed and whatnot uh, so in the meantime uh, Elioth ends up coming and it's seen, and a lot of people I've seen a lot of rumors online that people were thinking that Cassandra Nova was actually controlling Elioth uh, but she does not have control over Elioth in fact I'm pretty sure she actually hides away from him too uh, now maybe she would be powerful enough to control her uh, control him. I'm not 100% sure because I do know that Loki and Sylvie when they worked together in season one of Loki I believe it was they were able to control Elioth and that's sort of how they came to the Citadel at the end of time uh, but it appears in this movie that Cassandra Nova although she's super powerful she's not that powerful she's not as powerful as Loki or Sylvie especially when they were working together so she uh, from what I can tell she does not control Elioth she runs and hides away and so Deadpool and Wolverine are able to make their escape and then they end up coming to this uh, little cavern or cafe which is kind of just here in the middle of the void which actually still has food and uh, alcohol in it which I thought was a little silly but uh, anyways it's there and this is a scene of course that we also see in the trailer as well and you know we see them sort of having a banter there's actually a lot of scenes I found that were in the trailer that were actually not in the movie or maybe I just overlooked it but uh, I'm pretty sure in the trailer they had uh, a scene where him and Wolverine and Deadpool are eating and De Deadpool is not wearing his mask and Wolverine's like it's really hard uh, for you to eat with your mask or uh, Deadpool is like it's really hard for me to eat with my uh, mask off <laughs> or, or on and then Wolverine's like it's really hard for you to eat with it off it's really hard to eat when it's off and I don't think that that I don't recall that actually uh, being in the movie so I guess the trailers were caught with a little bit of footage uh, you know or a little bit of deleted footage I guess that was not actually in the movie but either way they end up coming to this cafe and this is probably one of the first times that Deadpool actually sort of opens up a little bit to Wolverine and you can tell here that he's actually almost like a fanboy uh, almost like us the fans you know we love seeing Hugh Jackman as Wolverine so here Deadpool is sort of you know being like a little fanboy to Wolverine as well and he tells him uh, and he explains to him how Logan was his anchor and how in his world Logan is a true hero but then this version here of Wolverine tells Deadpool I'm not a hero uh, you know uh, in fact he tells him quite the opposite he says in my world you know I'm not he's not really worth anything and whatnot so it's just a really nice heartwarming little moment because it really makes you feel for Wolverine and that's one thing that Hugh Jackman has always done a great job with uh, whenever he portrayed Wolverine is that he always does a, a phenomenal job at bringing the heart and the emotion and making you really feel uh, the pain that Wolverine uh, has and the pain that he's in and in this case he's actually wearing the yellow suit so it's the pain that he literally physically carries with him because it reminds him of the X-Men all being killed and so finally Deadpool and Wolverine they actually leave the tavern and then they end up running into this uh, person whose also name is Deadpool but he's nicknamed Nice Pool and this is also the first time we see Dogpool which was so funny because Deadpool for this entire movie Deadpool was like uh, he wanted to keep Dogpool uh, he, re he refers to himself as Deadpool Prime actually and so he you know he wants to keep the dog but the dog is loyal loyal to Nice Pool and you know he's Deadpool is actually joking all through it the movie you know he's kind of like well you know hopefully nothing happens to you why not which is also sort of foreshadowing the fact that something is going to happen to Nice Pool by the end of the movie he is going to be killed uh so it was kind of it's just really funny how deadpool is kind of hoping that he was going to die just so he could take the dog 
And so then uh, Deadpool and Wolverine ends up getting into uh, the car, which is, once again, I, you know, pretty sure it was pretty good uh, pl uh, product placement. You know, they're obviously advertising the Honda vehicle here. Uh, and, of course, in the movie as well, the Wade is also a, a, a car salesman, like a pre-owned car salesman, but he's not very good at it. He doesn't really uh, get many sales, so he's probably not making that much money. He's probably pretty poor. Uh, you know, we learn that he's actually living with uh, Blind Al, and she actually complains to him at one point about having to, uh, you know, pull his weight. So he's very poor, so it's, you know, it's just really fitting and a great way to sort of have product placement. Uh, but in this uh, scene here, when they're in the car, just like in the trailers, they do have a falling out, which leads to a brutal, absolute brutal fight which ends with them both basically passing out and knocking each other out or simply just you know going to sleep from exhaustion as you can see deadpool is wrapped up in a bunch of uh belts and wolverine is over there asleep but the reason uh why the, this fight breaks out is because uh, here wolverine realizes that deadpool lied to him because deadpool ac accidentally slips up and says if we can save your world and then he realizes uh that you know that you know his world being saved is not necessarily 100 percent guaranteed he's really just sort of going on uh you know he's really just going on a hunch and so uh you know this obviously caused a lot of strife because of the amount of pain that wolverine carries with him anyways so he he's only helping deadpool because he wants to save his own universe uh but then deadpool sort of like i said slips up and tells him well we're not really 100 percent sure if it's going to work uh, so that's why this fight breaks out and then they end up waking up, both of them end up waking up in this weird cavern, tavern uh, type area or loft. And this is when we get our biggest cameos of the movies, uh, most of which I was expecting because of just rumors of stuff online. But one cameo specifically I was not expecting. So Wolverine uh, and Deadpool are finally up. As you can see, Wolverine's in the background drinking. But when Deadpool comes through, this is when all the cameos come in. And the first cameo we get is, of course, Jennifer Garner, and she portrayed Elektra in, I believe it was 2000, maybe the year 2000 or 2001 or two. Uh, she portrayed Elektra in the Daredevil movie, in which Ben Affleck was actually uh, playing as Daredevil, and so she played Elektra. But eventually, she actually ended up branching out and having her own movie as Elektra as well. So it was really great to see her back. And honestly, she actually looks pretty good. You know, she still looked really good as Elektra. She still, uh, you know. Uh, you know, she she looked pretty well the same as what she did all the way back then. She was still very fit, still very cool, and she did a great job uh, at playing Elektra. And once again, you know, this movie did a great job with all their cameos. These cameos didn't just appear and then go away. All the cameos, all the characters in this movie were, were here for a reason, and they all played into the story, which was really cool. So that was like the first big, really big uh, cameo. But then the next cameo that we got was a cameo that I was not expecting, which was Wesley Snipes returning as Blade, which was so cool because he actually makes a comment in this movie. He actually says there's only one Blade, which is kind of cool because Mahershal Ali, we know, is already cast for Blade, and he's supposed to be having a movie coming out eventually, uh, but that movie keeps getting delayed and rewritten, and they're always looking for new directors and stuff, and then here Wesley Snipes walks in the original Blade, and he's just like, yeah, there's only one Blade, <laughs> and so it's really great to see Wesley Snipes again. As, this is actually the first time I've seen Wesley Snipes in a very, very long time. They do joke about him being retired, so I don't know if maybe in real life he actually was retired and he just came out of retirement to do this one cameo, to do this little one-off. Uh, but once again, you know, I really liked how much he was in the movie. He, he didn't just appear for no reason. All of these cameos actually had a place and they actually stuck around. They had a lot of dialogue and they looked really cool playing off of each other. So it was great to see Wesley Snipes return as Blade. But I, I did find that he looks probably the most most aged out of all of them with the exception of Daphne King but Daphne King was very young when she first played X-23 and of course you know once you go through you know once you once you go through puberty and whatnot and as she matured obviously she was going to look older but i did find wesley snipes looked really really old then we had a really cool uh, cameo here with gambit who was betrayed by channing tatum as you know for 
probably a few years now, uh, or at least uh, a year, a, a few years back, you know, for a few years, it was rumored that Channing Tatum wanted to play Gambit and that he wanted to actually have his own Gambit movie. And they, once again, Deadpool actually jokes about it here. He actually tells him, you know, are you actually a superhero or are you just here because you wanted to be a superhero, but you're not really? He even makes fun of his costumes. He's like, you're like, you look like a superhero version of Hawkeye or something, he says, which was really funny. Uh, but I will... Um, but after seeing Channing Tatum's portrayal of Gambit, or at least this portrayal of Gambit, uh, I'm kind of happy that they never gave him a movie because I'd, uh, I didn't really like his portrayal uh, as the character in this movie. Uh, I loved the action sequences. I loved how he moved. I loved the magic. I loved all the cards and all that stuff. But I wasn't really a big fan of the character himself. Uh, but I do think that he fit this movie, and I did enjoy seeing him here in a one-off, but I would not want to sit down and watch an entire movie uh, with him in it. But I did enjoy seeing him in this movie. And then, of course, probably the biggest cameo or the most appropriate cameo uh, was, of course, Daphne King returning as X-23. I kind of wish that they did not show this one in in the trailers because I think that she was the most important cameo of all of them. Whereas the other cameos were important to the story and they were still really cool to see. But I feel like Daphne King's character, X-23, who's actually, her real name is Laura, she's like... In the comics, she's sort of considered Logan's daughter because she's cloned. She's like a clone from Logan, so she has like the same ability, same power, so to speak. And so her name is Laura, as as opposed to Logan, and she's known as X-23 because she was a part of the X uh, trials, the same as Wolverine. I can't remember what uh, number of Wolverine was. He was like X. I can't remember if he was X-1, maybe. Uh, but either way, Daphne, uh, or Laura was X-23. So I kind of wish they held her back. I wish they didn't really show her in the trailers, just because of the fact that, um, you know, I think it would have been really cool to see that reveal in the movies. And not to mention the fact that I think that she was the most important uh, character. I think that if they wanted to show one of these four uh, cameos they should have showed maybe either Channing Tatum's Gambit or Jennifer Garner's Electra and then save the rest and not show an X-23 I think uh, I think that sort of ruined the surprise but it's still great to see her she was all grown up here and she was great here I would be curious to see if she's going to continue on in the MCU or will she continue on in the mutant saga and keep playing X-23 I kind of hope she does because she was you know, Marvel does have a tendency to keep having uh, the same actors play the same characters for many years. So it would be cool to see her, uh, you know, stay in the uh, stay in the MCU. And it would also be a great way to not have to recast Wolverine. Because we know with the multiverse saga, there's going to be many different variations, different versions of the same characters, oftentimes by different uh, actors. And this is a great way to sort of let Wolverine go away without recasting him by just keeping her here. Uh, because she is sort of like a product of Wolverine. Wolverine, and she still interacted with Wolverine in two of these movies, in this one and also in Logan. So I think it would be really cool uh, if she just sort of became the new Wolverine and took his place in the future, of course, after the multiverse saga, after, you know, whatever happens after the soft reboot. I think she would be a great replacement for Hugh Jackman, and I think that she would carry that hurt of Hugh Jackman as well. I think she would. I think she would be a, uh, an appropriate replacement. And so then we come to a very, very emotional scene. Uh, probably one of the more emotional times we've actually seen Hugh Jackman uh, portray the character. He actually cries, and and I don't know that we really see, uh, you know, Logan or Wolverine cry a whole lot throughout the other movies, uh, other than X3, I believe, X-Men 3 or X-Men United, uh, or, uh, sorry, X-Men The Last Stand. I believe he cried when he killed, when he had to kill Jean Grey. Uh, but that's probably one of the only times we he gets that emotional w and when he lost his own wife as well. Uh, but beyond that, he doesn't really have a whole lot of emotional uh, scenes like this in all of the entire Fox franchise. So it was really good to see him uh, get this moment. And it was it was really emotional. He owned X-23 was there and uh, delivered once again a line that I think that they should not have shown in the trailer. Uh, but they did do it a little bit different because he tells her, you know, hey, kid. I'm not who you think I am or something like that or I'm not the uh, I'm not who you think I am or I'm not the right person or something he says and she's like you never were the right person but in the trailer she said you know you were never the right guy until you were and they they do show that full uh, conversation at the end of the movie but I'm pretty sure here at this 
at this one certain spot, all she says is, uh, you never were, and then they sort of go on to the next scene. I could be wrong with that. I, I can't even quite remember now. But I know that we do get that whole dialogue, but I can't remember if it was actually here or if it was the flashback. But either way, it was really cool. It was a really good moment uh, for X-23. And also, it was really cool because she knew the other version of Logan, and she was able to sort of help this version of Wolverine sort of, you know, get to where he needed to be to help Deadpool and whatnot. So it was just a really heavy emotional uh scene really and so the next day then they all decide to go and fight cassandra nova head-on and they, you sort of get then like the uh, fox version of the avengers when you get all the cameo cameos from the different franchises the only thing that i feel like was missing from here was johnny storm so it could have been maybe just for uh budget cast maybe it just would have cost too much to have johnny storm here because storm you know would have been completely cgi he would have had to be on fire all the time and maybe chris evans just cost too much to have there as well but it would have been nice if we could have seen uh storm here but you know i'm still very happy with what we got still really cool to see blade x-23 gambit uh and garner and deadpool and wolverine you know a majority of them you know you know, four out of the six characters were actually mutants. Blade is vampire, of course, and Jennifer Gardner. Electra, she's not really, uh, I wouldn't really say that she was much more than a human, but she does oftentimes in the comics sort of dive into magic and be involved with magical stuff. Even in the Daredevil uh, TV series, she was brought back to life using, uh, you know, the... Um, she was referred to as the Black Sky, I believe it was, and she's brought back to this sort of dark occultish uh, blood magic type stuff. Uh, so I guess you could say sort of she's probably a little more than just being human. But either way, because uh, I can't quite remember how her movie ends. I can remember the Daredevil movie, but I can't quite remember the Elektra movie. But either way, it was really cool to see them. This was sort of like the Fox version of the Avengers. And then they go against all the old Fox characters. As you can see, you got Toad and Juggernaut, Azel, I believe is how you can pronounce his name, Azazel or something like that. And then you have the other Weapon X who has the, the long fingernails, who's also sort of like X-23 and like Wolverine. So it's just really a really cool showdown. And, and whatnot and then so through all that you know when everybody's fighting each other Deadpool and Wolverine ends up getting through it all and they go up to see Cassandra Nova and of course she's just a boss she's uh, very similar to Charles Xavier really but she seems to be more physical where he was more like he fought from a distance using his mind using Cerebro whereas Cassandra Nova was very hands-on she was like here in your face literally touching you uh, so I don't know if that's how her powers differ a little bit from uh, from Professor X. She has to actually like touch you in order to sort of get into your mind. She has to actually uh, touch your mind. So I'm not 100% sure uh, if that was absolutely necessary or if that's just simply how she did it just, you know, out of just because, you know, she liked toying with the enemy, so to speak. And as you can see, um, Wolverine's face here, he's really uh, devastated in this scene. He's going through a lot of pain. This is when you get a little bit of a, a backstory as to everything that happened to uh, him in his universe as well. And I was also a little bit uh, a little bit confused here as well because I'm uh, plus I, I couldn't really hear this part of the movie all that great either. And I was wondering if if uh, if she actually controlled him and he was the one that actually, you know caused the humans to turn on the x-men and that's why he took the blame or if the uh humans turn on the x-men just because you know they sort of always do there's always sort of that human versus mutant uh you know division so to speak in the world in all the x-men comics and even in the animated series so i wasn't really 100 percent sure if if they just turn on the mutants and he felt guilty because he wasn't there to be able to help them and protect them and save them or if he was actually the cause of uh the you know if he was actually the reason why the humans turned against the mutants maybe she uh tampered with him or did something to him but from the gist of it but from what i can get is that she actually did not control him she had no power over him he just felt really guilty because he wasn't home during the time when the humans turned against the mutants, which also, you know, sort of left me with a few other questions as well. Like if the mutants really did turn against, uh, or if the humans really did turn against the mutants, and they really were powerful enough to take out the X-Men, 
I would think that they could only do that using like the Sentinel program or like Trask Technologies or something like that, which would also which also made me wonder well why was Wolverine still alive, or or if he was still alive why was he still walking around in the open, and not only that but why did all the humans hate him? Did they hate him simply because he was a mutant, or or whatnot? Because you know when he got to the TVA, Mr. Paradox said that he let down his entire world, so. It's kind of hard to know, I think, really what... I think I think they could have explored his backstory a little bit better, uh, but it's okay, I guess, for the purpose of this. Maybe they really just were trying to show you that he's in a lot of pain and that he feels a lot of guilt, and that's why he wears the suit, which was fine, and it was good enough for me. I still uh, like the backstory. I just think that they could have dove into it a little bit more and, and really made it even more emotional, but it's still they still did a great job you know, with what they had. And so during this, of course, Deadpool is able to get Juggernaut's helmet on uh, Cassandra Nova, which prevents her from being able to use her power. Now, I thought it was very interesting that they said that Juggernaut's helmet was very similar to Magneto's. It was able to drown out the power and stop the power uh, of telepathy and, and whatnot and everything that she can do with her mind. Uh, so I did think that that was pretty interesting because I don't know that we, uh, I don't know if they explored that in previous X-Men movies or not, but I did think it was pretty cool how they explored it in this one. And so they end up getting her uh, on uh, with the helmet. And this was actually really the moment when Wolverine sort of had his redemption arc. This is when, once again, we see this troubled, uh, sort of tortured soul uh, you know, version of Wolverine now becoming once again a hero because Deadpool has the ability to actually kill her right here, right now, but because he has the helmet on her, she's, you know, completely vulnerable. She has no abilities uh, and no powers, and Pyro just shot her a bunch of times. So she's actually dying, but Wolverine sort of, uh, you know, talks to Deadpool and intervenes to some degree, not physically, but just intervenes and tells him, you know, that he has to let her live because her brother, Xavier, would not, you know, allow, he, you know, he wouldn't allow uh, Wolverine to just stand up and watch her die. So that was a really big redemption arc for Wolverine as well, just that one moment alone. And so because of this, because they end up letting her live and they give her back her abilities, this is when we see uh, the sling ring that she's using, uh, which you learn is called the sling ring in the Doctor Strange movies. Uh, but it looks like it has the time stone and the reality gem in there as well. And she opens a portal, which allows Wolverine and Deadpool to jump through the portal. And they end up going back to Wolverine's time period, which I believe was World 10005 or 10009. But I'm pretty sure it was 5. I can never remember if it was 5 or 9. But either way, they end up going back to Deadpool's uh, world, uh, even though when we were watching the trailer, I was always under the impression that maybe they would end up going to 616, uh, but they actually just go back to the Fox uh, world and they go back there. And so as soon as they escape, uh, Cassandra ends up escaping as well. And as you can see, she ends up taking over uh, Paradox, so to speak. Like she goes into his mind and does that weird thing with her hand where she's able to put her hand inside of his head and inside of his body, which is really disturbing, really, and almost uncomfortable to watch. Uh, but she does it, and she basically blames him for uh, breaching their contract and the agreement that they had about her, I think, staying in the void and having control over certain points uh, of the void. So she ends up coming back to the real world, and then uh, she ends up dragging him down into the subway, which is where he has the time machine or that device where he has the ability to actually prune the timelines, which is something else that I still didn't really understand even by the end of the movie. I still wasn't really 100% sure as to why he wanted to do this to begin with. Like, what was the purpose of him pruning the timeline, really? Because whether he did it now or he just waited 2,000 years, you know, he would have... In either way, the timeline would have ended, uh, but it's just seemed really strange to me that he was in such a rush to do it uh, because there was really no benefit of him doing it. Either way, the timeline would, or at least was supposedly going to end, so I just thought that was a little strange. But anyways, uh, when she takes Mr. Paradox down to the machine, the portal is left open, and this is when we get the, uh, the Deadpool Corp. Uh, and whatnot. And this here was another uh, little uh, piece in the movie that I was a little, uh, I, I was a little confused by. Like I didn't understand if you had this many different Deadpool's, why were they all bad? Like why, why were they all working for Cassandra Nova? 
or if they weren't working for Cassandra Nova, why were they all like just evil? Like I would have thought that there would have been more than just what we call Deadpool Prime. I would think that there would have been more like him as opposed to just straight up evil. Because I know that, you know, Deadpool is more of an anti-hero more so than an actual hero. But I wouldn't think that they would be all that evil, you know. Like I just didn't really understand why the Deadpool Corp were that bad and why they, you know, wanted to... Uh, you know, why, why were they after Deadpool and Wolverine and, and, you know, why were they just up to all this mischief? Uh, nice Pool sort of gives a little explanation to it, I believe, earlier in the movie, but still, to me, it just kind of fell flat. I think they could have explored that area a little bit more as well, uh, as opposed to just saying that, you know, just sort of having them there and then being evil. But then again, then we wouldn't have got such a cool fighting sequence like what we end up getting. And then finally, after, what, I believe 20 years of Hugh Jackman portraying the character of Wolverine, we finally see him mask up, and it looks absolutely phenomenal. He looks so cool here. You know, he was sleeveless. He had the mask on. I was very curious about how it would uh, work once he donned the cowl, and once we actually got to see what it would look like in real life. But honestly, after seeing it, I didn't think it looked that bad. Uh, at first, I thought it was a little silly, but, you know, it really dawned on me, especially once the action sequence started. So he puts it on, and uh, he he does uh, have a funny, sort of like a little funny remark here. Deadpool is like, are you ready? And he's like, and Wolverine is like, well, if I get the opportunity to kill a hundred of you, yes, I'm ready. Let's do it. <laughs> so it's kind of funny because, you know, he's sort of annoyed by Deadpool the entire time. And so then uh, the two of them, both Wolverine and Deadpool, just goes at it and they literally annihilates the entire <clears throat> Deadpool corp with the exception I think of Dogpool and uh, zombie uh, Deadpool head or whatever he's called or Deadpool head uh, but of course most of these Deadpools have the ability to regenerate anyways but it was just so, such a cool uh, sequence really uh, just you know it was crazy pedal to the metal just tons of action tons of blood and tons of gore everything that you would expect uh, from a Deadpool movie but I will say that out of all the Marvel uh, movies that we've seen up to this point, I do think that, for me at least, uh, as someone who has read a lot of comics and stuff growing up, I do think that this uh, action sequence was probably the most comic book uh, relatable. Like, this felt like a, a, an action sequence that came from a comic book. Uh, even the way that it was shot, like it was almost like you're reading a page and going to the next panel. And then the sequence ends with a really cool shot as well with Deadpool and Wolverine, uh, you know, jumping out of the black uh, back of the, the bus. And that whole bus sequence was crazy as well. Uh, but once we see him uh, coming out uh, from the bus like this, you can see Wolverine doing a very popular uh, comic book pose, and it was just so cool. And you know, it was I don't know, it's just it was a really cool moment uh, where we got to see them take on the Deadpool Corp and whatnot. And so then they of course end up hurrying down to the subway, which is where the machine is, uh, because Cassandra Nova is of course uh, still using this uh, time. Uh, I don't even know what you call it, this uh, world-destroying device or whatever you want to call it, and she hooks herself up to it, as you can see. And so the, they learn from Mr. Paradox that the only way that they can really stop this device is by actually turning it off, and the only way that they can actually turn it off is by making the device sort of attack itself, because there's no, you know, you can't just unplug it. There's no energy source, really, that could probably stop it unless they you know sort of redirected the current and took the energy from the device itself and use it against itself and so when they get down there once again another phenomenal redemption uh, arc for Wolverine he holds up Deadpool's picture that uh, Deadpool used earlier in the car and told Wolverine you know there's only nine people in in this picture and that is my entire world and so this is why Deadpool wants to go in and sort of make this sacrifice you know he's willing to finally give his life uh, you know to save everybody that he loves to save I, I think arguably not only his timeline arguably maybe the uh, a bunch of timelines because it seems like it would not have only uh, you know affected his timeline but it seems like that device might have had the ability to really eliminate a lot of timelines and so this was like the one time that Deadpool really had an opportunity to do something really big because in the first two movies he still saved people but they were really small stories and even though this story here is kind of small in the sense that it's, it's a grounded story it had huge ramifications throughout the multiverse because Cassandra Nova did have the ability to prune and eliminate timelines so you know, even though if it sometimes might feel like a small self-contained story, and it is, 
it is sort of like a one-off in its own little pocket, the ramifications of it could, you know, really echo through all of the MCU, especially for something like Loki. Loki, who now sort of, you know, keeps the multiverse, uh, you know, in check. You know, so I, I really thought that that was, you know, this was Deadpool's big moment, especially in this movie after he's, you know, rejected and turned down by the Avengers. Uh, you know, that really hit a nerve with him, really hit or hurt his heart. And this was his opportunity to, you know, you know, actually do something that's bigger than himself. And in my opinion, probably one of, uh, you know, the, he's probably one of the most important heroes in uh, the multiverse saga after this movie, because like I said, this device probably could have eliminated a bunch of other timelines as well. I think it would have been cool if they, uh, they could have still uh, used Kang. I know that they, they fired Jonathan Majors, and I know that they are moving away from Kang, and especially after Comic-Con, they've released uh, Victor Von Doom is going to be the new villain. Uh, well, actually, people are assuming that it's Victor Von Doom. All, all it says is Avengers Doomsday. That could actually just be Iron Lad or another version or an evil version of Tony Stark, but we'll have to wait and see how that goes. Uh, but either way, you know, I think that it's... Uh, I think they could have at least referenced Kang here with this technology. They could have said that uh, he who remains had this technology, or maybe they could have said like there's another version of like Ouroboros or something. I think they could have explained the technology a little bit better, but either way, it was still cool. And so Wolverine tries to talk Deadpool into letting him go. He's like, "Listen, you stay, stay with your family. I'll go in and I'll, you know, I'll do the sacrifice and and don't worry about it." But of course, we end up having basically a uh, kind of like an Armageddon moment if you can remember back in the movie back in the 90s with Armageddon one guy was supposed to sacrifice himself uh, but then uh, the father ends up doing like a bait and switch Bruce Willis I believe it was uh, actually Ben Affleck was in that movie too and that's sort of what happens here just as Wolverine is about to go out and make the sacrifice Deadpool attacks him and throws him in and locks himself in there uh, in the room with the uh, with the power source of this device and he's trying to reach it uh, but he just simply is not able to but fortunately Wolverine is able to get in just in time right before Cassandra Nova actually wipes out the timelines and then Wolverine and Deadpool uh, together ends up joining forces and you can see uh, you know the uh, Wolverine's whole like outfit ends up getting blown off everything except his cowl and you can see how uh, ripped Hugh Jackman is for his age I believe Hugh Jackman is like what 50 in his 50s now or maybe even almost 60 so he's in really great shape uh, you know to still be playing this kind of role as someone like Wolverine who you know he is a superhero so he has to be jacked and he has to look like a superhero and so then Wolverine and Deadpool together ends up uh, holding hands basically and they complete the circuit causing the device to basically shut itself down and causing it to explode uh, but they did a really good job with editing this scene because during this whole sequence uh, you get the flashback of both Wolverine and Deadpool you see Wolverine's flashbacks from different parts uh, I, I'm pretty sure they mainly focus on the Wolverine trilogy not so much the X-Men uh, the X-Men franchise but more so just the Wolverine trilogy they had some scenes from Logan from the Wolverine and and also uh, from X-Men Origins and then the same with Deadpool you got Deadpool's flashbacks from Deadpool 1 and 2 with him using Cable's timeline I think they actually showed um, Vanessa when she died before he went back and saved her and they also went right back to when Deadpool first became Deadpool and he was strapped into the experiment so you know it was, it was a really great callback to both of the trilogies and I would say that this was a really great way to end Wolverine's story and definitely end the trilogy for Deadpool as well but I have no doubts in my mind that both Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds are both going to continue on at least until Secret Wars maybe it'll change after that but I do think that you know they will continue on at least up until secret wars and then of course the whole uh device ends up blowing up and for at this point in time mr paradox thinks that wolverine and deadpool are dead but we know that both of them you know they got that healing factor it's almost impossible to kill either one of them you'd probably have to you know actually destroy every little molecule of them at least deadpool anyways maybe not wolverine but deadpool you would have to you know destroy every single molecule uh, or else he's just going to regenerate and then of course uh the tva ends up coming and this was i think b15 i believe she was uh called in the loki series who's now uh head of or a hunter was it hunter 15 or something like that they used to call her in the loki series now it seems like she is sort of head of the TVA. The last time we've seen her was in Loki season two, and it seemed like she was taking over the TVA then. And so she ends up coming to arrest Mr. Paradox because Logan and Wade ends up coming back and they 
basically ends up spilling the beans and telling on him and you know <laughs> you know they they tell uh hunter that you know this guy had this device and she also considers uh cassandra nova an omega level mutant which i think is going to be very important uh moving forward because it seems like maybe the tva or other types of uh, departments, maybe even like damage control or something, may end up categorizing the mutants once they officially come into the MCU. Uh, that's when I think they'll be categorized. We've sort of seen that with Civil War. I think we're going to see that a little bit with Captain America 4, Brave New World. Uh, so, And also we've seen that with Miss Marvel as well. They had the DO, I think it was Damage of Control, uh, something DOCC, I think it was, or something like that, or the DOC or a department of, yeah, DODC, I believe it was, Department of Damage Control. So I think that they will sort of have that, uh, you know, in the future, especially like with Trask and stuff. we also seen that in uh, Secret Invasion, how the government end up going off to kill all the scrolls. I think all of that is sort of prelude to uh, the X-Men coming to the MCU because we know the mutants will be hunted for sure. But either way, they take him off and then uh, B uh, Hunter, uh, I believe it was B-15, ends up telling... Uh, Deadpool and Logan that not only did they save their universe but the universe is actually striving is actually getting healthier and getting stronger and doing better now than it ever has which makes me kind of wonder you know what was the whole point of the story to some degree like why is the you know because Logan is still dead in the future in 2099 so how is it all of a sudden that you know everything is working and going well Paradox told uh, Deadpool that he can't just swap, uh, you know, swap a variant just because he has a variant of Wolverine does not mean that he can use that variant to, you know, save his timeline. So I was a little bit confused about that part as well. But either way, uh, Hunter says that everything's good uh, and whatnot. So I think that that's going to be significant for Wars because I think now that we see that the Fox universe or the X-Men universe is alive and thriving well, I do think that they will now go on to sort of a collision course with 616. Uh, I was also surprised that we did not see uh, Monica Rambeau. We know that she's stuck in one of the X-Men worlds as well, which could be a sequel. Maybe they'll do like a Wolverine and Deadpool number two or something like that. I, I don't know where, where they'll go next, uh, but Monica Rambeau is stuck in one of the X-Men universes and so... I think that uh, the resolve of this conflict here with, with, with this 10005 universe being now restored and thriving, I do think that it will eventually run into uh, 616 and that will be our basically secret wars where all the characters from all the different franchises will end up in battle world. But we'll have to wait and see for sure. And then we get a really funny uh, final scene here with Deadpool holding uh, Dogpool. And they actually uh, have a great call back to 2020, or uh, back to the 2012 first original Avengers movie. When, if you can remember in the post credit scene, all the original Avengers were sat down eating shawarma. And now you see Deadpool and Logan sat down eating shawarma. And Dogpool is with them, which was hilarious. Uh, you know, Deadpool seems to really love Dogpool. So, once again, very funny sequence. Uh, but also a great callback to the Avengers as well. And this Logan now is actually going to be staying in this timeline with Deadpool. So, not only does he stay in the timeline, but uh, Wade ends up bringing Logan to meet all of his friends, including... Blind Al, and of course his girlfriend Vanessa, or well, his ex-girlfriend, I, I would assume who will become his girlfriend again in the future. I think that that will be very likely a uh, reason why he gets involved with Secret Wars, or either that or some other multiversal character, someone like maybe Wong or Doctor Strange may end up recruiting him because he already went to Happy Hogan at the beginning of this movie and he was rejected, so I do think somewhere along the way there will have to be some form of excuse me some form of multiversal avengers and uh seeing a lot of people online thinking that maybe it could be like toby mcguire and his spider-man then hugh jackman obviously in his wolverine and then ryan reynolds and deadpool and like they could be the three core leaders of the multiversal avengers which i think is possible we also know from Multiverse of Madness, that there was an Illuminati, which was very well aware of the multiverse. There was also Reed Richards in that one, who was portrayed by John Krasinski. And even in this movie, we had Chris Evans return as Paro, and he also talked about his Reed Richards as well. So there's a lot of different variations and different variants of Reed Richards. We, ha we also have another Fantastic Four movie coming in the future, which will be from a different universe as well. So, <clears throat> you know, I do think at some point, 
Wade will have to be recruited, and I think Wolverine will come with him too, or the other way around, Wolverine will be recruited, and then he'll take Deadpool. But either way, I do like the idea of them potentially keeping some of the Fox X-Men uh, rather than just starting over completely. Just bring them in from different universes. That way it makes sense. Because if not, you know, where have they been since the beginning of, you know, since Iron Man and all those places? It's kind of hard to cover up, you know, 100,000 different mutants or perhaps even millions of them. So I think the only way that it will make sense is that eventually in Secret Wars, all the different universes ends up colliding. And then we end up creating one universe, one single universe, again, which will be the soft reboot. And that's where everything uh, will go down. And that's pretty well everything that happened in... Uh, in in the movie, there was a post credit scene. Uh, seen a lot of people online. They were kind of like, "Oh, this you know post credit scene is going to be mind blowing. It's the greatest thing you've ever seen." But it actually wasn't. It was only Deadpool uh, going. He was in the TVA and he's using uh, the TVA technology to look back over uh, something that, uh, like, uh, looking back over a conversation that he had with Johnny Storm, and basically just confirms that he was telling the truth and that Johnny Storm did say all these things about Cassandra Nova even though uh, he denied it when he was actually face to face with her. But beyond that, that's pretty well everything that happened in the movie. I don't think anything in the movie really had, you know, huge multiversal effects or any huge, um, you know, impact on the MCU itself. Not on 616, other than the fact that I do think that this world will eventually collide into 616 uh, for Secret Wars, and I do believe Wolverine and Deadpool will be a huge part of the multiversal Avengers but with that being said that's pretty well uh, everything for this movie I really enjoyed this one uh, I hope they do do a sequel I would love to see Hugh and Deadpool uh, return and do a sequel for this one It'd be also cool to see other cameos be cool if they could have gotten Jessica Alba back or Storm or somebody because they didn't have any of the original X-Men actually in the movie they were referenced but we never actually seen any of them so it would be cool if we could get to see them again in the future but I do think we'll probably see them in Secret Wars but I guess we'll just have to wait and see. Well folks, that is my open spoiler review of the brand new Deadpool and Wolverine movie. I absolutely love this movie. I gave it an 8.5 out of 10, and I can't wait to see this movie again. I'm sure I'll be watching this movie over and over and over for a very long time, and honestly, I was really happy with it, including the cameos and everything. Uh, I really felt like the cameos were actually a part of the story, and not just a one-off. And overall, I absolutely loved this movie so let me know in the comment section below if you've seen this movie and if you like to tell me why or why not i hope you like this podcast if you did go ahead and click the subscribe button and until the next video take care